But Morgan Stanley is an interesting one when you think about uh, their recent uh, takeover of E-Trade and the way that that was going to be going through, too. And I know that that has an impact on the way that the bank could be operating in the future and potentially some saying uh, that it could impact the deal itself. But our next guest does not necessarily agree with that take. That is, of course, D.A. Davidson, Managing Director of Equity Research, uh, David Conrad, who joins us now on the phone. Uh, and David, when we look at this, you do say that moving forward for Morgan Stanley, that there could be some risks tied to the way that that transaction with E-Trade might weigh uh, on earnings uh, in the future. But you're still pretty confident that that one's going to be a general boost for Morgan Stanley relative to the other banks, right? Yeah, I, I, I certainly believe that the deal will go through. Uh, Gorman has, has wanted to buy E-Trade for the bulk of his career now. I think it adds a lot of liquidity um, and customer, uh, digital consumer capabilities to the Morgan Stanley platform. You know, I think one thing to really focus on also is is really tying in um, asset management businesses with corporate America. Uh, so it's a lot of stock uh uh, vesting um, transition uh, in, into investable funds that they're driving at. So, you know, Morgan Stanley and E-Trade and maybe a closer competitor, Schwab, have all the stocks have been trading uh, kind of in line with each other. So I don't think any particular one of these stocks has fallen out of bed relative to the market that would uh, potentially halt the deal. Yeah, and I just, I mean, I, when we talk about all these banks, obviously they have different uh, specialties, different strengths uh, across the board. I know you follow um, most of them here that we're going to be discussing, but when you look at kind of the impacts and risks to whether or not things continue to get worse moving forward, uh, I mean, just the move that we saw from JP Morgan Chase adjusting their mortgage lending requirements, trying to make those a bit more strict since they don't know uh, how long this lasts and how, how much risk they have in terms of um, some of those uh, loans defaulting here. Uh, what do you think uh, people should be looking at when you try and weigh those risks and how some banks might be well positioned relative to the others? Yeah, I, th I think uncertainty is the big the big story coming out of the quarter. Um, I know when you look at uh, some of the, the broad-based numbers coming out of the banks, they look disappointing. But actually, when you look at core revenues, less expenses, there's been strong beats. It's really been the reserve build uh, anticipating future losses, which is what has driven down uh, the results. And, and frankly, part of that is an accounting change uh, that was implemented in the quarter that's created a lot of this volatility. Um, you know, I think when you think, you know, you discussed about the unemployment uh, earlier in your show, you know, I think I think where, where banks are, are are uncertain here is is the peak of unemployment in the second quarter, then how quickly do people uh, with the furlough go back to work? When do we reopen the economy? And, and does the government programs bridge that? Uh, but we're anticipating, you know, certainly still double digit employment even after that, which, which would create some form of, of credit losses similar to the last last cycle. Uh, the difference here, though, is banks' balance sheets are much stronger. They were all able to put up uh, strong reserves and make money. And so we think there's another quarter of big provisions um, coming. But then I think they've got a lot of that consumer risk ring fenced in our view. Um, we'll be looking to, to add more exposure to the names after that. Hey, David, it's Brian Chung here. So uh, we were listening to Neil Kashkari. Uh, he posted an op-ed earlier this morning saying that he would prefer that the banks uh, raise more capital and actually calling for the banks to suspend their dividends. We heard uh, James Gorman uh, earlier this morning on CNBC saying he doesn't plan on doing that. It seems like the big banks won't be doing that as well. But I guess aside from the question of should banks be suspending their dividends, I guess the larger question is, do the banks have the capital to support the amount of lending that's really needed out there? We know the PPP programs already dried up. Uh, small businesses and households need credit right now. But with the capital levels that banks have right now, can they meet that demand or will they need to capital raise somewhere? No, I do not think they need to cut the dividend, nor do they need a, a capital raise. Banks are still, again, well capitalized. Uh, each of these banks, you know, when you look at Citi, J.P. Morgan, uh, and Bank of America, grew loans by, you know, 50 to $60 billion in March. Um, they are providing the liquidity to the marketplace. Now, the payment protection program is is doesn't uh, impact their capital. That's kind of a pass through through the government. Uh, but we are seeing extraordinary um, lending coming out of out of the banks and supporting uh, the liquidity needs of their customers. And so, even after that, um, you know, I look at uh, capital levels next quarter. They may drop a little bit. But when you think of the level of reserves that they have to ring fence the 
the assets coupled with the balance sheet increasing and still being well capitalized, uh, I don't see the need for that right now. And then, David, lastly, the street seems to be favoring those that are more Wall Street facing as opposed to Main Street facing when you look at the reaction to Mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley earnings because they seem to do pretty well with their trading desks. But I'm wondering, with market volatility, they did better in March 2020 than they did in the market volatility when everyone was getting slammed on FIC trading in December 2018. Mm -hmm. What was the difference here? Yeah, I mean, I I think what's happened here is um, a lot of the volatility, especially in in, in rates and currencies, uh, really helped the numbers. The other thing that that, that helped the trading numbers, remember the the liquidity really dried up until the Fed uh, created a lot of the commercial paper backup programs, all the repo facilities. So there is a lot of activity uh, that the banks lent their balance sheet out in the repo market that really helped this trading activity this quarter. You know, as we ended March, though, I think volatility has eased up. The Fed is providing more liquidity. And also on the hedge fund side, we're seeing a lot of deleveraging. So I think that model gets a little bit tougher in the second quarter than the first quarter. Yeah, that kind of plays out in the numbers uh, that you have uh, on these banks, too. When you look at Morgan Stanley, 60% below the street for second quarter and 17 below uh, the street for Q3. So we'll see what happens out there. But for now, I appreciate you taking the time, David. Thank you. Hey, investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well, then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up-to-the-minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance, and information on how to manage your money every day, wherever you are.